And this is, as I mentioned before, this will be our last class together. It has been a joy and a blessing to be with you all. Hope you have an amazing Christmas season um, with family and friends and have had a great holiday weekend this last weekend and week. Let's pray, and then we'll get started through the last three chapters of Acts. Father, thank you so much for the blessing of being able to gather again today for all those that are here in the room with me and for those online. Uh, Father, I just pray your spirit be with us. As I've prayed in nearly every class, I guess, and I think about it often, help us not just to learn information, but find out ways to be transformed in our lives to be more like Jesus. We are so grateful that you left us the scriptures to study, left us the truth of the word. We know we are a blessed generation to have them in the forms and all the forms that we have them, all the tools that we have to study. But Father, we know the greatest tool that we have for studying and for knowing Jesus is your spirit. So Father, help us to hear him um, very clearly. And Father, we uh, commit always in our lives to, to give ourselves over to you and to your will, to your lordship. Bless us through this night and into our futures. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so actually the class session tonight is supposed to cover uh, chapters 26 through 28. Because we weren't able to meet last week, and I'm sure that you guys studied and read through, I, I do want to talk a little bit about what happened in chapter 25 just to get us sort of up to speed. So we're not going to read that chapter like we normally would. Um, but I just want to point out a few things. So um, this is where Paul was brought before Porpheus Festus, uh, verses 1 through 12. Uh, Festus was the Roman governor of Judea uh, who came after Felix. So he is a, man, a Roman um, leader who is appointed to govern a certain area of the Roman Empire. It was you know, typically their, their policy or their way of doing government or or kingdom to go into a place and not necessarily force everybody to become Roman, but rather to be vassals of Rome. And so they would allow a lot of uh, the regular customs and traditions and all that to take place as long as it didn't violate some of the core things about uh, you know the Roman Empire and Caesar's leadership. And so they always had people who were there kind of overseeing things, and they typically were the head of the court, sort of like the, the head justice of the Supreme Court of the land. So when important things needed to be heard, they always got brought before the governor. And so Paul comes before the, uh, the governor, and uh, the Jews are trying to accuse Paul, and it says um, in this section that they brought many serious charges against him, which they could not prove. And so Festus has a little bit of a trouble uh, with them. Uh, he understands all these charges, but he doesn't see any basis or any reason for him to, to do what the Jews want to do. And they want Paul to be executed, actually, uh, for, what he, for what he's done. And Festus just does not see any reason for that. So he gives Paul a chance to give his own defense, which is pretty typical. You see this. Um, actually, in the next couple of chapters as well, Paul will come before somebody, they will hear from the opposite, much like a court today, right? We, we hear from the prosecution, we hear from the defense, the defendant gets to say his piece if he wants to or if not. But every time Paul does speak up for himself. And so his, his defense is interesting in chapter 25 because it continues on through the rest of the three chapters. And his defense is basically threefold. So he says, number one, I've not done anything against the law of the Jews. Um, Paul, in fact, you know, still continued to be involved with some of the traditions that we've already seen. He, he entered into some, um, um, oh, I just lost the word that I wanted, some rituals with other Jewish people just to show he still had a connection with the Jewish people. Though he didn't depend on the law for salvation, he depended on Christ, faith in Christ. He still was a definite practicing Jew. So he said, I've not really broken any of the laws of the Jews. I've not, I've not done anything against the temple, uh, you know, the Greek gods, so to speak. And he said, I've not done anything against Caesar. 
who the Roman governor would consider to be king. So he says, I'm not, you know, I've not done anything against any of these people. I just preached Jesus Christ in him crucified. And remember what the main point of the witness is, the resurrection of Christ. We hear this over and over in Acts. The main point of their witness is to be witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. And that point um, was a real problem with the Jews, uh, but also a real issue with most everybody. That just didn't happen, right? Resurrection isn't something that just takes place every day. I don't remember the last time I saw somebody resurrected from the dead. Actually, I do remember, like, never, right? I don't know about you guys, but it's pretty unusual, right? That's when the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees, they look forward to that. It's in their description. That's all yeah. they, they talk about. Is looking forward to it. That's why I never understood how these people hated Paul so much. He was telling them about going up their own Right. Yeah, he says that over and over again. This is a fulfillment of what you guys have always believed, the prophets and the law and everything pointing toward Jesus. I'm just telling you, Jesus Christ is the Messiah you've been looking forward to, right? So the unusual thing, though, the Pharisees believed in a, a life after death, the resurrection of a human being back to life, you know, was something still that challenged, you know, their understanding of how things happen. Um, so Felix asked him about... Um, going to Jerusalem and face charges there. So know now that he's in Caesarea, uh, the capital of the Roman uh, province of Judea. And Paul basically says at that point, uh, instead of going back to Jerusalem, he says, I instead want to go before Caesar. Any Roman citizen had the right to choose to, to take his case toward to Caesar, the highest court in the land. And so instead of uh, going back to Jerusalem, uh, he appeals to Caesar, and Felix then confers with his council or the rest of the court, basically, and says they determine, you know, he's asked for it, he's a Roman citizen, and so off to Rome you will go. And so uh, King Agrippa uh, was a Jewish leader of that time in Judea, so Felix, I'm sorry, uh, Festus is a Roman leader of Judea, and uh, Agrippa is the Jewish king, basically a descendant from the Edomite group, the Edom, the clan of Edom. And so Felix, um, uh, sorry, Festus consults with Agrippa because he really had no definite charges. The problem with sending Paul to Caesar is you have to send him with some pretty serious charges, right? Or Caesar's going to wonder what's going on down in Judea. I'll put you in charge. and. You're not doing such a good job down here. So he's trying to figure out what charges should I really send? And he figured Agrippa would have a better idea of what was going on because he was around Jerusalem. He'd heard more of what happened to Paul. And so Paul is brought before Agrippa, Bernice, um, and, then, um, and then Festus, uh, the high-ranking officials and some leading men of Caesarea. And that's where chapter 25 ends. So let's start in the chapter. 26 and we'll read there from we'll read on from there then agrippa said to paul you have permission to speak for yourself so paul motioned with his hand and began his defense king agrippa i consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as i make my defense against all the accusations of the jews and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the jewish customs and controversies and therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jews all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they're willing, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope and what God has promised our fathers that I'm on trial today. This is a promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. O king, it is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? Again, here's the point of the resurrection being sort of central to the message. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. 
Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. On one of those journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, I was on the road. I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I've appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn from their darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea and to the Gentiles also. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That's why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and testify to a small, great, to small and great alike. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses would have happened. Uh, said would happen that the Christ would suffer as the first arrived from the dead would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it is not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long. I pray God that not only you, but all who listen to me today may become what I am except for these chains. The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice and those sitting with them. They left the room, and while talking with one another, they shouted, uh, they said, this man is doing nothing that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And so here's this, um, one of his major defenses at the end of Acts. And uh, it's interesting that uh, though he keeps um, making his case for not really having anything major uh, that they can hold against him or any of these claims or charges that are really worth imprisonment um, at, the, at the end, even imprisonment or, or certainly death. But he makes this inter interesting statement that if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, he could be let go. And so for some reason, it seems that once the appeal has been made, that, that that's sort of a done deal, that once, you know, the governor said, it's off to Caesar, you go, that it didn't seem to go back. Um, but um, I'll bring your recollection back. I think I noted at least earlier on, if you remember, um, he had an encounter with Jesus where he told him that he would go to Rome in order to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So I'm, I'm guessing in some way the Holy Spirit is involved with what's happening with Paul as he makes his appeal to Caesar. I think he has in mind that vision of his, um, his goal to go to Rome. And so he sees this as his opportunity to go. And then even through what, what happens here, um, he doesn't get let go. He doesn't, you know, get claim innocent and not be sent to Rome. Um, after all of this takes place, they still say it's off to Rome that you must go, which is exactly what he wants. So I just want to notice uh, a couple of other things here. Th did you notice how he speaks to the authorities with great respect? So it's always King Agrippa or most excellent Festus or uh, Paul really understands well how to communicate to people in a way 
that doesn't cause any unnecessary walls to be built. And I really need to hear that sometimes because uh, I can find myself when I'm in opposition with people, um, you know, not thinking well enough of them to give them the respect that all people are due. And Paul always seems to do that. And so I appreciate that lesson in me. And I think hopefully in us that as we, uh, as we go about um, proclaiming Jesus to people and the resurrection to people, if they oppose us, it doesn't mean that we should disrespect him. I see that all too often today. And I think it's really important that we always maintain respect for all human beings. We can disagree with what they do or say or practice, but they are still a human being, a child of God, right? That, that deserves our respect uh, as someone who follows Jesus. And so um, he proclaims again his purpose given him to Jesus. This is a um, actually a, a, a statement that sort of flushes out more what Jesus said to him on the road. When you read back in Acts, when he first meets Jesus, you don't hear him saying all these things about, you know, you going to be a, a witness to open the eyes of my people and I'm going to protect you from your people and from the Gentiles. And so um, this is a, one of those examples where we know for sure that something more took place with that conversation than we first read about. And so even in other conversations, know that in scripture, we're getting the, the important things when we need to get the important thing. But there's probably always more said. Even John at the end of his gospel said, and if I had written down everything that happened, you know, while Jesus was walking the earth, there wouldn't be enough books that, you know, available to hold all that happened. But we get the important things, the things that God felt like were necessary for us to believe and have faith. So Paul states that his ministry is actually um, an obedience to that vision. And what was the vision? What, what was it Jesus said? You're going to be a witness to what you have seen. And what Paul had seen was the resurrected Christ. And so uh, he's obedient now and understands that Jesus was, in fact, raised from the dead, even though he was in great opposition to that idea before this. And so his main message is that everybody, Jews, Gentiles, everybody needed to repent and turn to God. We're going to hear that again in just a couple of um, chapters later on. And it's, uh, it's one of the points where the Jews, again, come in great opposition with him. Because he quotes this passage from Isaiah that Jesus also quoted uh, from Isaiah about people always hearing but never believing you know always seeing but never understanding um and so it actually becomes a huge problem for paul that he's he's fearless in the way that he speaks about jesus and so festus basically interrupts him and accuses paul after hearing about the resurrection saying he's out of his mind to think that there could be a human being that actually was raised from the dead and you know came back to life and walked around like you say um, but Paul turns this back on Agrippa, remember, he said, well, Agrippa knows about this. And do you remember why he said Agrippa had to know about the resurrection taking place? He said, because it didn't happen in a corner. It wasn't something that, you know, was not seen by many people. When we read about the resurrection of Christ, he appeared to, to many, many people. And so that story circulated. Uh, around during that time we talked about this earlier about Luke um, including all these specific names and places in his account of what's happening here with Paul and his companions and others as a way um, to to prove that what he's saying is true and so the proof of the resurrection is that it took place with many witnesses many witnesses in Jerusalem and had it not been true it could have been easily discounted because there would have been people nobody to claim it true but because there were so many that claimed it true it could not be discounted and paul even realizes that agrippa knew about this he heard about this he knew the stories may not have encountered the resurrected jesus but he certainly encountered you know all these stories and knew they could not be proved false so agrippa's reply is one that's just classic do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Um, and what's fun for me when I read this is Paul did this. He he committed, uh, he 
convinced a lot of people to be Christians in this very short time. But Agrippa, you know, for whatever reason, I think we'll hear some later, he decides, you know, he's not just going to turn himself over and be and become a Christian just because he's given him this short synopsis of who Jesus is. And so Paul's plan uh, was always because of this call uh, earlier in Acts 23, 11, that's the place you find it, where Jesus tells him he's going to go and preach the gospel in Rome. It's always Paul's plan. It's always what he wants to do. And he will eventually get there. And that, that's what we read in the next few chapters. Any comments before we move on to chapter 27? Okay. Um, yes. You know, you know, I think sometimes we have not talked about it in traditional Bible classes, but Drusilla and Bernice and Agrippa II were all brothers and sisters. And the, the relationships were pretty much um, as the world turns. <laughs> That's the only way I know how to explain it. The, these were the notorious playmates of the fir, of the early church. I mean, the fir, first century. Agrippa was not is not to be seen as one of these dignified old kings. He was a young man. He was a playboy. He um, he lived. He didn't live for, as if he didn't live. He lived as if there were no tomorrow. He was notorious and immoral. And they swapped wives. There was a lot of magic involved in uh, potions and that kind of thing, but in, in light of your in light of your comment, Mark, I really think it rings that here's this old man and, and he's he probably doesn't smell very good. He's probably not dressed in the best clothing. He's probably got and he, he refers to the fact that he has chains. And here this this man is, and it just touches my heart that this man who loves Jesus so much is willing to talk to these young people about their soul. And I think we ought to remember that. And he did it politely. He did not scold them. He did not treat them disrespectfully. He was in fact a perfect gentleman uh, in their presence. And yet, it, I don't know about you, but if it were me, I used to have red hair and it would just upset me no end <laughs> to see an incestuous relationship and try to preach the gospel to them. Yeah. I've had a lot of situations where I did some personal work and it was difficult because I knew some situations. But Paul did it and he was a gentleman and he never backed off. And I think it's one of the most beautiful passages in Acts. Yeah, and we even remember back in chapter 17 when he's at the Areopagus, he starts it off by saying, uh, to people who, you know, he knows are worshiping gods that are no gods at all. He says, I can see you're very religious people. So he's always using um, the right language and approach and respect to people in order to gain a hearing. Well, he did it, you know, he did it with First Corinthians. He, he, he scolds them for 15 chapters, but starts out by saying, you have all the gifts. <laughs> yeah, you're, right. you're really privileged. You're really great people. And I love you and all that. And then he starts in on, and I think this is really, really beautiful. I just think it's beautiful. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, let's read on 27. We're going to read through the whole chapter again, so bear with me. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from Andromethan, sorry for these words that I'm going to murder, about to sail for parts along the coast of the province of Asia. And we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day, we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go, um, to, go to his friends so that they might provide for his needs. From there, we put out to sea again and passed to the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There a centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Sindias. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete opposite Salome. 
the move, uh, we moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lasia. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the feast, which is the feast of the Day of Atonement, uh, which took place in their uh, in our calendar around the end of September, the first part of October, depending how it goes. It's like it's kind of like Easter. It's according to a calendar, not by date, by time of year and moon and sun and all that stuff. So it's late in the fall. Um, so Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that they should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force, called the Northeaster, swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along as we passed to the lee uh, of a small island called Acadia. We were hardly able to make a lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they had passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together, fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice and not sailed from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God who I, uh, whose I am, last night, an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. Short time later, took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep, fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks. They dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors left, let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you, can, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it fall away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. Then daylight came. They did not realize uh, when daylight came. They did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow struck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered that those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get on planks or other pieces of the ship in this way, 
everyone reached the land safe. So here's this account of this um, pretty terrible journey that they were on. Um, and it's, it's toward the end of the chapter that we find out there were 276 people on the ship. And I don't know what your picture is of the ships of that day, but, but I don't picture a ship big enough to hold 276 people. Um, I mean, that's a huge ship. Now, I understand that some of them were prisoners, so they didn't have staterooms, you know, and nobody had staterooms back then. But still, a ship that size is pretty big. And so the storm is big enough and bad enough that even in a ship that size, it's having a very difficult time in the sea. So I gave you a map to look at, and you can look at it later, but you'll notice the route that they took. And when they leave Crete, they basically get out into open waters. So um, maybe other people know this, I always have to rethink it. When I hear of a northeastern wind, I always think it's blowing northeastern. But in fact, a northeastern blows from the north and east. So it's really blowing sort of south and west, right? So if you look at the map, you understand that when they leave Crete, they really need to go to the west, but the wind is totally against them and the ship can make no headway whatsoever. And they find themselves out in the middle of the sea. And the only way that they think they can survive, if you notice the map on the northern part of Africa, um, they're trying to avoid that coast because they know it's very shallow and there's a lot of sandbars and they don't want to run aground. So they put down what they call a sea anchor. And a sea anchor basically is just, it's not an anchor that's meant to hit bottom, it's an anchor that's meant to drag water so that the ship slows the, you know, the wind blowing the ship. So they're doing everything they can to keep from the, the ship, you know, hitting the north coast of Africa. Um, and then you read that passage where it was 14 nights without seeing the sun or the stars. So hurricane force winds. Um, what, what was that? Is it you know, do we do it by modern standards, you know, where we consider what 70 mile an hour sustained winds at the eye to be hurricane force? Or for them, it was, it, you know, it could just mean a really, really severe wind or storm. Either way, uh, it, this really was a terrible time for them. Um, so much so that we read later on for these 14 days, they didn't eat, not because. Not because they were sick or not because there wasn't food to eat, but they were in such great suspense, it says, of distress during this time, fearing for their lives, that they were really just kind of hunkered down, I think, trying to survive, doing everything they could. They, they brought the lifeboat aboard and tied it to the ship so it wouldn't bang against the ship. They, they secured ropes around the whole ship to sort of tie it together, hold it together because the waves were battering the ship, they just weren't meant to take this kind of abuse like ships today are, right? Made out of this thick steel and it can take amazing storms. Um, but for them, you know, they felt like it was just gonna break apart out in the middle of the ocean and there could be no way they survived. But it's here that we hear that Paul makes this statement that I saw uh, an angel came to visit me last night and he told me I'm gonna be in Rome uh, preaching before Caesar, and so God has also given me all of your lives. He's going to spare all of your lives because he has this plan for me, and so he says, you know, just don't, you know, be courageous. Don't, don't lose heart, uh, but you must stay on the ship, and it's interesting here. Remember when they get ready to sail from Crete, they don't listen to him, um, and the, the guard who's in charge of him, the centurion, instead takes the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. And I think to myself, okay, so here's, here's Paul again, as Kirk said, a prisoner in chains, probably dirty and unkept, um, not a sailor, the guy's a Pharisee, you know, he's a teacher, he's telling us this, and then here I have the pilot of the ship and the owner of the ship, they know what they're talking about. Who would you listen to, you know, if you were a centurion? So it's not so unusual that he doesn't listen to Paul and he listens to them. And when they get that favorable wind to start off a southerly wind, which would drive them, they could use to go north and west. Um, they listen to him and go, but it's right after that storm comes. But now when Paul says this, and then the next thing we hear is that some of the people were putting down the lifeboat 
uh, pretending it was an anchor to get off of the ship. And this time they listen to Paul and they actually tell him, don't do it. And they bring the lifeboat, they cut it loose and let it go. And they make him stay on the ship. Um, later on, uh, the, the, the other soldiers that are there want to kill the prisoners because as they run aground, they're all going to get off the ship and now they're going to lose the prisoners. And they're probably worried. Remember that a Roman soldier that loses a prisoner doesn't fare well, right? So if they think it's better, let's just kill them and we won't have to worry about keeping track of them. Um, but Justice uh, instead uh, tells them, no, you can't do that. We're all, and he lets them off the ship. Either if you can swim, swim. If not, find yourself a piece of the ship and get to shore. And they all make it there um, safely. So all these ways that God is taking care of them um, in this in this terrible storm, I can't imagine what it was like for them. Um, you know, I hear about people who sail for a living, you know, on ships for a living. Um, I actually watched this series not long ago about why ships sink. And there were like, I don't know, 10 or 12 stories of why these big, huge ships, why they sank out in the middle of the ocean. And what I draw back from that is don't ever get on a ship, <laughs> you know, because they sink, <laughs> even these great big sinks. And um, sort of the interesting part is some of the crews that were there on these ships that sank and they were one of the few to survive. One of the things you hear from them most often on the show was, I decided I would never sail again. So that's how bad I feel like it was for them. I'm trying to imagine how many of these sailors that were on the ship said to themselves, that's it. I'm going to be a sheep herder. I'm going to be a tent maker. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to find a way to fix wagons or something, open my own shop, um, but I'm not going to be on the sea anymore. I can, I could feel that happen. Because this had to be a terrible, terrible storm. But the other side of it is, look at the amazing way that God is working um, through angels, through the Spirit, um, you know, to keep them safe. But here's what I want you to see. He keeps them safe in the storm. And he doesn't take away the storm. And it sort of reminds me of what happens with Jesus in a way when they're out, you know, in the winds and they think they're going to drown and Jesus is asleep in the back of his boat. Do you remember this story? Um, they're all afraid they're going to die and Jesus is asleep and he gets up and he calms the storm for them. But here's a case where the storm is so bad, everybody thinks they're going to die and God does not calm the storm. He just sees them through it. And I think that that's important lesson for us that God can work in a multiplicity of ways in our lives to accomplish his will. It doesn't always mean we won't go through the storm. It just means we have to continue to put our trust in him and, and trust in what he said. Well, I don't believe that God ever used that storm for the purpose to drive that ship where he would be years of expense and all the preaching and the sort of things that they promised him to do. I was reading that uh, Medicaid for her in the Mediterranean is not very common. So, and they have a, a large city. That's right. Yeah, you, we're, I'm going to get you there. You know, how you just have to trust me. Hang on. So it's interesting that I, I actually looked because I was going to tell you, you know, what a terrible time of year it was to sail and what were they doing sailing and what was the pilot and, you know, the owner saying, yeah, let's take off. It's okay. <laughs> so I looked online and uh, I found out, um, you know, I just looked for best times to sail in the Mediterranean Sea. And you know what the best times to sail are? Uh, September, October, the very time when I'm like, okay, that, that's not going to work. So, um, you know, I just think that so even though it can be the best time to sail, storms can always come up, like storms can always arise. But I got to believe God's hand is in the serving his purpose. Yeah. And Paul, Paul needs to be not the 276 captive audience, too, uh, seeing this 
inheritance from somebody the same you will receive. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you just have to trust and stay on board, you know, and then to, then to hear, you know, the ship's going to come aground on some island. He didn't know where they were going to come aground. They don't even know yet where they are until they actually get on board and start to interact, as we'll see in the next chapter with the natives that are on the island. They tell them where they're at. And so they're actually not even in Italy, in Italy yet. Um, they're still south of Italy as we know it today. And even south of, um, um, oh, what's the island just south of Italy? I just lost it. Sicily. Sicily. Mm -hmm. So they're still south of Sicily. They're not, you know, they still have quite a ways to go even in their time to get to, to Italy and certainly Rome, which is in northern Italy. So um, they find this sandy beach and they lift up the anchors and they just let it go. But the ship still grounds early and just is torn apart. Uh, just perfectly according to Paul's vision, right? Where none of us are going to lose our lives, but the ship will be destroyed. Um, and Paul still mentions in the midst of this, you know, if you'd listen to me, you wouldn't have all this destruction <laughs> and all these problems. But um, that didn't take place. So let's read on the last chapter and uh, we'll be finished. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and for three days entertained us hospitably. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and, after praying, placed his hands on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. So in your Bibles, I'm not sure what version you're reading. I'm reading the uh, older version of the NIV when it says, um, let's see, it's in verse 4. This man must be a murderer, for he escaped from the sea. And then the next word, justice, what's the word in yours? Justice has not allowed him to live. Is it justice? Anybody, do you have the NIV? And that's a that's a god. That's yeah. one of the pagan gods. Right. It's capitalized in the NIV to indicate what they're saying is that their god had made the determination because the snake had bit him that he was in fact being judged by their god. And so the turnabout is when they realize that he gets bit by the snake and nothing happens to him, then their reaction is, oh, you must be a god. Paul doesn't, you know, there's nothing recorded that says Paul said anything against that statement. But I, I'm like 99.9% .9 guaranteed that he did. He said, you know, I'm not a god. I'm a person just like you, but I serve a god who is powerful enough. So I think that... The thing to see is it says a viper, but the islanders, uh, once when they see the snake, they're familiar with it. They know everything on that island. It's a very small island. So there's probably not a piece of land or a creature or a, you know, a tree or a plant that they're not aware of. And when they see the snake that's attached to his hand, they know it's poison. So it's not a question of, oh, it was a snake, but was it poisonous? Because the islanders reveal like, oh, we expect you to get sick or just to fall over dead. And I think the reason that they think that is because it's happened before. They well, probably they have the Yeah. Right. And so they, they know he's bitten by a poisonous snake. And so they expect this, but when it doesn't happen, um, then they, they proclaim him to be a god. 
And the very next story we hear is where he's brought to the house of the city official and the city official's father is deathly ill uh, with fever and with dysentery. Um, and I want you to notice this because so, so important, I think, um, in the way that we understand how God works, that Paul goes into him and the first thing that he does is not, you know, I've got the power. He's not like, you know, Bruce Almighty that realizes he has all this wielding power of God. The very first thing he does is he prays. He goes in by his bread and after he prays, he lays his hands on him and is healed. So um, I think this is really important for us to understand that um, Jesus said, whatever we whatever we do in his name will be done. Whatever is done on earth has already been done in heaven. And the idea that Jesus tries to tell us is um, when you were connected with me, when you were seeking my will and finding out my will and knowing my will, then the things that, that I want to have accomplished will be accomplished. And so through Paul, he heals not only his father, but everybody else hears of this. And as they come, then he heals lots of other people on the island. Um, and so on Malta, we see this pretty huge change in the way Paul um, and his companions get treated. Like they get, even though they're prisoners, I mean, they must know he's a prisoner because they have soldiers and guards that are still there, you know, guarding him. And I'm sure he's still in chains most of the time. Um, you know, when I guess he probably had some freedom, he was out gathering wood. But they know he's a prisoner and there are other prisoners on board. But he receives um, such a warm welcome from them. And that last closing statement there where it says they, they honored us in many ways. And when we were all ready to sail, they furnished us with supplies we needed. And uh, what I see and what I want you to see is that God starts to bring about this turn of events in Paul's life. We're all throughout the, the book of Acts, as we've been studying, we've seen how Jews are really sort of separated between those who come to believe and trust that Jesus is the Christ and those who oppose him. And those who oppose him even chase him around, wanting to kill him, trying to find ways to, to get him you know, imprisoned and put to death and um, all of these things. It's all this opposition. And now we sort of see the swing where now where he's in a place where there's only Gentiles who are believers in a God, right? They have some kind of um, religious ideology. When they see God really reacting and acting, they have this total change and they just honor them and help them. And when they get ready to sail, it says they give them all that they need to set sail to make the rest of the journey. So I think that's important for us to see that God is beginning to sort of make a turnaround of events in some ways. And, uh, and I think that that still happens where there are times of persecution for us, even individually, times where we, we get a, a lot of opposition. And then God, I think, provides us times of more peace and uh, more support. Um, I don't know if you've experienced that. I certainly have. And so I love the way God does that. Um, he tells us in the scripture that when we face trials, we'll never face more than what we can stand up under, that he will always help us to stand. And I think that's the way he does it. He gives us these times. Uh, of Amen. I think it's providential, don't you? Oh, absolutely. And just like us, Paul was a human being and needed some encouragement, I'm sure, along the way. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I think it's interesting, Bob. Also, was a very small island. I think the population was now they're in great, but 276 people off the ship, so it's not <laughs> insignificant. They were yeah. caring for them during this time, but sure. not only did they care them for them during this time, and it wasn't the time of harvest, so they'd yeah. already harvested all the food. But they provided 276 people all the supplies they needed out of their stores, yeah, for them to get on the ship and sell it. Right? So, uh, there must have been some great impression. Yeah, great point. You know, I didn't consider that, but you're right. It had to be uh, a pretty good hunk out of what they planned to make it through the winter with, right? When the non harvest season, sure. Yeah, so generous to, to do that, not only take care of them, but also give Mark, them. Mark, 
Yeah. Mark, there's I think there's one more thing that you could you could put down. The name of the snake was uh, the the god that they gave. The name of the god they gave to the snake is Dike. Hey Dike. And that's the common word for righteousness in the book of Romans. And Paul is going to use that word in Romans 4 to describe the status of the sinner before God in Christ because he has been made righteous. I think it's interesting that in that case, the snake the snake was mis totally misnamed. Just totally misnamed. Pagan God. All right, thank you, Kirk. All right, let's finish up. So after three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods of Castor and Pollux. We put in at uh, uh, Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there, we set sail and arrived at Rigium. The next day, the south wind came up, and on the following day, we reached Puyuto, uh, Putaloi. Putaloi. There we found some brothers who invited us to spend a week with them, and we came, and so we came to Rome. The brothers there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the Forum of Apius and the Three Taverns to meet us. At the sight of these men, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was all allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, my brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our, of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and to talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, we've not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of the brothers who have come from there have reported anything. Uh, none of the brothers uh, who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear your view, what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will ever be hearing but never understanding. You will ever be seeing, but never perceiving. So these, for these people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. So here, once again, the final chapter uh, section of the book, he, he meets with the Jews. It's the very same reaction that he's had. Some come to believe and others don't. They get in this disagreement. Um, and then I love um, sort of the irony. Well, Paul says this statement about Isaiah, you know, you... The Holy Spirit said through the prophet, you're the people that are always hearing, but never believing, always seeing, but never understanding. And believe it or not, some people got mad and laughed at that, which I think is kind of hilarious in some ways. Uh, but that's his final word to them. And then his word is uh, that God told me, I'm going to go to the Gentiles and they will believe. And, and we see that, right? The difference between what's happening here in, in Rome right now with the Jews and what happened with the people on Malta when they saw God at work and I'm sure heard the message from Paul. They came to believe and honored them when he goes to Rome. Again, speaking of the Jews, they have a problem. There's disagreement and there's trouble. And then the last paragraph says that Paul got to live on his own in a rented house with one guard and that he, lots of people came to him and he welcomed them all. 
And there's this last statement that closes the book. After all of these problems and all of the opposition and everything that Paul has faced, it says, boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God. And I love that as the ending of the book and how the Holy Spirit wants us to see that in spite of opposition and hard times, if we just stay faithful, that he does give us these times. And there are times when um, without hindrance, uh, we have the blood changing the word of God, which we do right now. Uh, but let me encourage you that it may not always be the case. Right? You guys know sort of the way our culture is moving and the way uh, opposition is growing and it's growing in other places of the world. So it may not always be that way. I pray that will be in our lifetimes. But if it's not, then trust in God, stay faithful, keep preaching the word because it is the truth of God and it is what people need to hear, whether they will accept it or not, it's not up to us. And I hope that you know that your, your work in the kingdom as God is not to make sure that people believe and you do whatever you have to to make them believe. Your role is to plant seeds and to preach the truth. And then it's God's work um, through the Holy Spirit in the hearts of people who are willing and ready to come to believe. And so we see this amazing book of what was happening um, in the later years after Jesus is um, ascending to heaven, giving that mission um, to them. And it's been passed on from generation to generation to generation to you guys and to me. And I uh, have this amazing honor to speak for Jesus. So I hope you keep doing it. Any other comments or questions? I just want to amen that, Mark. That's so good. That is so good. We need to hear that. He was unhindered without any hindrance whatsoever. It's the last word. And I think Luke is saying, God always has the last word. <laughs> yeah. He, it, it may look dismal and we may act defeated, but we are not. We are victors and we are winners. That's right. And we are, we are just like Paul. And we're, we're writing, somebody said we're writing volume two of the book of Acts. Yep, absolutely. So go have a peaceful night and be victors in Jesus' name. It's been a blessing to be with you guys. God bless you. God made us to be seed chunkers. He didn't teach us to be head beaters. Yeah. Just to tell God's word. That's all. That's what the power is anyway, right? Amen. Yeah. So when's our next semester going to start? So um, the next semester will start the end of January, I believe. Uh, if you get on shbi.org, uh, you'll see the full list of classes there and where they'll be held. Um, I think most of them, again, will be offered online. Um, I don't know that there will be one offered here at this building. I have a, another commitment for a class in the spring, so I won't be teaching the class in the spring, but there'll be lots of good classes offered. Um, there is a, um, I'm trying to think of the Church Berean Christian, which is just inside the loop, uh, just inside the Beltway, I'm sorry. Uh, so that's one place that there are classes offered if you enjoy you know, being in person but you can be online for any of the courses. Kirk uh, Hayes, who is the director and the president, actually lives in Canyon, Texas now. So, Any classes from me? Just yeah, yeah, he, uh, they got to move Susan, his wife, uh, her mom passed and she had the house, Susan grew up, uh, she inherited that house. And so they had the opportunity to, they've been remodeling it for, like a year and they had an opportunity to move into it. And so they felt like it was the, the right time for them to move. Always always trip, always <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Mr. Mark. Yes, Stephanie. Uh, what was the website again? It's shbi.org. Mm -hmm. Shbi.org. And I think it's actually on your um, syllabus for this class if you forget it. Okay. So it will reach out. But yes, and since you've registered, Stephanie, um, Dennis is right, they will, um, or David is right, they will reach out to you and send you. Okay. I think Are they, you teaching anything in January? I am not teaching in January again, no. I'm, I teach another class. One of my mission points is to teach a, a homeschool group 
of all things auto mechanics, but we get to talk a lot about Jesus while I'm here. <laughs> so okay. that's the class in the spring. But there are lots of other classes that are being offered by some pretty amazing teachers. All right. Well, I really enjoyed your class <laughs> and I've really learned a lot. Well, thank you. What a blessing. What an encouragement. It's been good to have you with us. Y'all have Thank a you. Week.